Hello Buttercup, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is all about discussing why the last unicorn animated movie is better than the book. So yes, I think that the movie, of which I did grow up on, side note, so maybe there's a little bias and nostalgia there, but I think that the animated movie is better than the book. I just recently read the book and gave it three and a half out of five stars, but the movie out of a you know five star scale, I would give it four and a half out of five stars. So really talking about the animation first because I think that is what makes it so magical and whimsical and nostalgic and just beautiful but also there's a sadness to it. It was animated by Rankin, Bass, and Topcraft which is, was, was. <laughs> housed out of Japan. So it's an interesting mix of anime and Western animation for the 80s at that time. And Top Craft did the animation, if you think that it kind of looks similar, for The Hobbit and Return of the Dragons. But Top Craft went bankrupt in 1985 and with laying off a lot of people and just a lot of shuffling around. It then became Studio Ghibli. We all know that studio. Love some of those movies and I need to watch a bunch of more. But you can tell the art of Studio Ghibli is pretty prevalent in The Last Unicorn. And specifically it is done in 70,000 cells and richly hand-painted backgrounds which are I think absolutely stunning and gives it a medieval fantasy look that kind of does it in the book but I think it's just better visually and unlike Disney animated films that are shot at about 24 frames per second this is shot about 12 frames per second which you can see a lot in anime as well and I think that is where the animation in critique say it lags or is too slow or it's not as smooth as Disney but it's because it's shot differently and I know a lot of people will say that for anime movies or TV shows but it's about how they film those shots. I think the, sh the shooting of that of The Last Unicorn is fantastic. I think there is a eternal uh, magical feel to the I guess you could say slowness of the animation versus if you compare it to a Disney movie it's really fast and it just like this this is this and I mean for the last unicorn she's immortal and there is um, a lot of other points that I'm going to make about how the movie is fantastic but I think the anime style of 12 shots per second versus 24 seconds gives it a like, a like a feeling that you're part of a magical story and it's different from all the, all the rest and this novel was pretty it's a classic fantasy kind of a new thing it's a new thing compared also uh, with C.S. Lewis's Narnia books and Tolkien's books. We all know those people, right? And so, but this isn't epic fantasy, especially the book, because the book is pretty short, but it is considered a classic. And so to this animated movie as well. I'm gonna pronounce the human woman's name wrong, I'm sure. Amal Amalthea, okay. I messed up so many times reading it in my head, but then I heard people say it a few times, but I didn't say Amalthea. I said Amalthea. So I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. It's Amalthea. That, look at me. I'm jinxing myself. Okay. Amalthea's inspiration, so like the female version of the unicorn, is from the main character in the Belladonna of Sadness, but she still ha uh, stands out against the other younger blonde long hair main characters that you often see in top crafts 
other previous movies before they go bankrupt but she has purple eyes and lashes which I still find to be a bit odd but purple as well as blue but with purple it's often seen as a magical color so that might be the reasoning and it's kind of like she looks like a human every other piece except her eyes and her eyelashes are purple so like I don't know <laughs> It's an interesting um, choice. Another thing that I thought was really cute that I just, I love the small stuff, right? Is that Peter drafted the screenplay of the movie and you can definitely see the magical spark. And I think that movies or TV shows that have the writer involved just turn out better. Personal opinion. <laughs> But I don't think that's really contested. Now, what's interesting to me about the last Unicorn movie is it's seen as dark fantasy for this time, which is the uh, 80s. And to some, it's still considered dark fantasy, though I'd say it's more heavy and deep and philosophical fantasy because of the topics it deals with and also the subtle literary references throughout the book and movie that if you don't know about them then you're gonna miss them just straight off the bat you're gonna miss it the two other like dark fantasy movies around this time were the dark crystal and The Secrets of Nim. I watched it once and I have forgotten about it so I should probably watch it again because <laughs> I'm interested. Like so it's like those three that actually were popular. So you have Secrets of Nim, Dark Crystal, and The Last Unicorn and they're all like together as dark fantasy. I would argue The Last Unicorn isn't but I guess for some people compared to Disney movies yeah however you remember the black cauldron around in the 1980s from disney yeah that almost bankrupted them because it was really far off on the disney vibe that it's like their bastard child i love the black cauldron i watch it at least once a year it's fantastic but that's they don't talk about it disney doesn't really talk about it it has a cult following but we still don't talk about it. Then, you know, in the 90s, you have The Nightmare Before Christmas, and that's all uh, fun and dandy. But I guess, you know, in the early 80s, when The Black Cauldron came out, Disney fans or animated movie fans were not used to it. I don't know. But the three uh, groupings that I mentioned, including The Last Unicorn, kind of sort of used to it but not really but I think out of those three the dark crystal was the most popular and it might have been because they were puppets I don't know like a hundred percent sure was not born in the 80s didn't grow up in the 80s so I can really only just look back and say that I would say for sure the dark crystal is dark fantasy it's creepy as hell <laughs> but that's why it's fun not sure about the secrets of Nim, and then for the last unicorn i think it's because it has very heavy topics for a children's movie that they then consider it a dark fantasy but okay moving on now i love that christopher lee was king haggard um he has an amazing voice absolutely amazing and also i think that mia farrow voicing the unicorn was lovely and it was a great fit because she has like a very light and airy voice. And I don't, I, well, I just can't picture a unicorn having like a deep voice or a rugged voice or a scratchy voice. Like it has to be light and airy. And I can't even do it because my voice <laughs> is a little deeper than uh, Mia Farrow's. And that's not shade to anyone, including myself. It's just different voice doesn't work with certain mythical creatures or with a certain character totally fine now the music okay we're missing the music works very well even though you don't think that it would especially when the 80s band america sings 
the main song, The Last Unicorn. Okay, I have it on my playlist and <laughs> I belt that song out. Okay, I just, I, mm, that's a good song. And they also do a few other songs in the beginning. And then at the end, nearing the end of the movie, uh, Mia Farrow, and then also Jeff Bridges, who was not really well known at all. He does Prince Lear's voice, like they sing together. It's like a cute little love song, you know. It works. I don't know how, but it works. Like, would you really think like a? I don't know if they're hair metal. Um, what is America? It's like, I guess, pop rock. I don't know. Like, they're very. 80s looking so I think you get the vibe right you wouldn't think it it, wor it works it works love the last unicorn song by America you should look it up and then the also the instrumental music throughout the movie of course works as well and I think what why the music works including the songs written and sung by America works is because the animators had access to the songs while they were animating the movie and I think that gives it an extra spark because they were placing the songs into the movie and then they created the like hints of what was in the song like so like there's a part where they're talking about hawks or eagles I forget which one hawks or eagles flying but then right at that moment when the lyric hits then you can see birds in the sky, right? And I'm like, yes, subtle, love it. We're gonna move on. The story itself is heavy. It's deep, it's philosophical. And it's geared towards children, though I, I don't know if it's for kids. I think maybe like middle school, of which that wasn't a thing, right, in the 80s. So it's like children, teenagers which finally comes about there's a you know 13 to 17 age range and then adults but there was no preteen there was no tween so i would say middle schooler age would be about the time that they would understand what's going on or like children understand in some way in a basic way what this book would be about because it's about death and we all experience death and we're all going to die and that's a huge topic and I, I don't have kids but I ran a tutoring center and even <laughs> tutoring all ages down you know to four years old for me personally I was tutoring four-year-olds all the way up to you know adults and even the four-year-old talking about death wanted to know about death so I don't think that we can say that it's not appropriate. I think it's how we talk about it if it is or is not appropriate because we are surrounded by death. They usually go for like a pet has died or maybe a family member has died, but it's gonna happen. So I think that this movie really dives pretty deep, I'm gonna say, and maybe that's why it's dark, but it dives pretty deep into a lot of things. There's a lot of topics that are subtle and you really have to pay attention and not be distracted at all to pick up on the deep themes, which are about death, love that will not go anywhere, you know, with uh, Prince Lear and the unicorn in her human form does not, you know, have a happily ever after for him, for her, yes, because she turns back into a unicorn, but not for Prince Lear and he has to deal with that and immortality and that's not just with the unicorn being immortal but regarding holding on to things for too long trying to keep them like immortal or alive and it just ultimately killing them and their love and life and overall meaning slowly and that's kind of with king haggard and him collecting all these unicorns using the Red Bull and just keeping them in the sea and they can't go anywhere. And like, he's so happy, happy, whatever, in the beginning, but then it fades because he has all the unicorns now. So like 
and then everyone forgets about the unicorns and they have like this weird idea of what a unicorn is and isn't so like it's kind of holding on to things and just stripping away their true meaning or their own happiness like the unicorns are not happy that they're stuck in the sea right but it's all about you it's all about king Hagrid and what he feels but then he doesn't feel happy anymore because oh whatever i have all the unicorns it's been 50 years what else and it's really thinking as well like what will you do for happiness king Hagrid cruel, mean, violent. Now he's really old and he got the Red Bull to do basically his dirty work so he can feel happiness every time he looks out his castle and sees the thousands of unicorns stuck in the sea. But then it's not happiness that he's feeling anymore other than like a brief moment because he already won and it's been decades and it's just like, what would you do for happiness? But also what is happiness? It's deep okay yeah now side note i would I just i just figured it out i don't know why it's probably the add but i realized that the butterfly in the beginning looks like peter beagle and that's really cute and funny but he still sings about the a train which is annoying but they took out the mentions of rhinos and elephants and pistols and guns so yeah i don't know maybe like maybe there's something i don't know about the a train that he kept in but then kept like took out the other stuff that i was saying does not make sense for a medieval fantasy novel and like what's up with the world building issue that i had with the book for the movie i don't know maybe i should look up the history of the a train but this is a medieval fantasy. You can very much tell that in the movie. So that's still a puzzle. Now, one of the scariest moments I think people then deem this movie to be dark is when the unicorn realizes or releases the harpy who then kills Mama Fortuna, the owner and fraudster of the traveling carnival that also basically uh kidnaps and imprisons the unicorn for money right the unicorn releases the harpy <laughs> and the harpy looks like the greek retelling right <laughs> so maybe that it, people would possibly find that inappropriate but i think in the 80s it was a bit more uh okay to show certain things i don't think that you would be able to do it now and say that it that it is a pg movie but i'm digressing the harpy just dive bombs mommy fortuna and slowly picks her away until she dies a slow painful death <laughs> yeah that is that was uh i was like oh shit okay I'm not like, I was surprised, but it, not in like a bad way. I'm like, oh, okay, they did it. Like the book, they did it. I'll give you props, Top Craft. <laughs> and I think that it really does punctuate like that whole scene, very violent scene, the sharp and intense instrumental music that it that accompanies the harpy as she's just picking away at Mama Fut uh, Fortuna. And then <laughs> I think it's so slick. And I don't know why I like this, but that's also where we meet Schmendrick the Magician, who's really annoying to me personally. <laughs> and so he's freaking out. He just completely can't keep it together. And he's about to run away. And the unicorn's like, no, no, you don't run away from immortals. You walk away. And then she just turns around and she starts walking down the road into the forest towards, you know, King Hagrid's castle. Because this is in the beginning of the movie. And Smendry's like, oh, okay. And so he casually walks with her and joins her on the adventure. I don't know why that's so amusing to me. But I think it also is showing that calmness wins out 
especially in dangerous and scary situations. Even though you really want to run or you want to just go at whoever is attacking you, whatever. You have to stay calm to be logical in a logical, rational state. And that's how you win out. And if Smendrick decided to run and scream his bloody head off like he was about to do, yeah, the harpy would have tore him to pieces as well. But in this world and in this situation, you, as the unicorn said, you have to be calm, cool, and collected around immortals or they sense that and then they'll um, tear you to, to pieces. <laughs> you have to be rational around immortals and their magic or else it's not gonna go well for you. Four and a half out of five stars for the movie and really it's this pretty good chunk of the movie right after the unicorn and Smendrick leave the carnival um, and they happen upon a handful of thieves and that's where we meet Molly Grew who's basically a mom to everyone. I think she could have been more fleshed out in the movie and in the book but yeah she's pretty two dimensional maybe one dimensional. She's just yeah she looks out for everyone and she cleans and she cooks. Okay not like a huge fan of that but I think the a little bit of character growth not maybe maybe not growth but a character insight is when she f she sees the unicorn and she's freaking out and she wishes the unicorn showed up when she was a child when Molly as the child needed a unicorn to comfort her and this is going to play on the concept of lost innocence that I'm going to talk about later but it's very sad, it's moving, and then Molly accepts the unicorn, you know, being present when she's like 29 or 30, even though she looks like she's in her 40s in the movie, and then the unicorn says, I'm sorry, I didn't know, and you know, we wrap things up and they then go on to King Haggard's castle. I think another disturbing part of this movie which is very moving and I can see how people would find it disturbing or at least uncomfortable but I think it's very moving and telling and very deep because you got to think about this line as I'm gonna um share soon so Smendrick Molly Unicorn come up against the Red Bull and the Red Bull is trying to get the unicorn into the sea because she's the last unicorn, but you know, King Haggard is um, kidnapping them for his pleasure, right? And Smendrick, who's really bad at magic, happens to turn her finally. She is turned into a human, and then the Red Bull's like, oh, what's this? Mm, okay, never mind. And he leaves. So she is completely naked and you know they use i don't know if they use molly's or smendrick's cloak but she's cloaked but not really right there is a point where she says like she's she wakes up from being turned into a human and she's like i can feel myself dying as we speak and you just have to sit there and you're like, she's been an immortal that doesn't age or like you age to a certain point and then it's done. She doesn't get it. And then you have to think about us right now and that after a certain point of growth, you hit the, the stop of the growth and then you're slowly decaying and I think that's really uncomfortable and scary for people because it's about death we're all mortals we're all going to die and at a certain point we're decaying we're not growing anymore and that is subtle and I think it goes into someone's unconscious and not necessarily their conscious thought of that but that's why it's like ooh, I don't like this scene it's making me uncomfortable I need to walk away or that's what's considered dark and they might not 100% know why 
but I realized what she was saying when I was a kid and I was like, oh, I wonder when I'm decaying because I'm a weird person and I was a weird kid. It's fine. I have accepted that and here we are today, right? Another person I liked, so I really love the unicorn and I'm, I enjoyed Prince Lear in the uh, movie. She, you know, shows up as a human, so very pretty with Molly and Smendrick and then Prince Lear sees her and goes about slaying dragons and killing other monsters to show her he cares because that's what heroes do. He's the hero of this story in many ways, but she doesn't like it. Uh, she's not impressed and I think that is a new twist on the hero trope because you usually have like the damsel in distress or whatever at least you know in the 80s or like the 60s because he wrote you know the same thing in the book plastered it on the movie that the hero saves the day and the damsel is like oh my god thank you but she's not into it and then he starts to doubt him, his actions and himself, you know, slaying all these dragons and just presenting her the head, which I would not be interested in. Okay, <laughs> like, thank you. I'd rather not have a dragon's head in my living room, but yeah. Can you get it away from me? It's smelly, it's a little, mm. Yeah, and there's blood dripping all over the floor. Like, who was gonna clean that up, Prince Lear? Like, <laughs> I'm not. Instead of like continually doing it and not changing, he then gets help from Molly, and then he starts writing poems and songs for Amalthea, and then she, you know, they start talking. Oh my god, what a concept, right? They start talking and they get to know each other. And this is also the point where she just is losing her memory of being a unicorn. So she falls, the human side, falls in love with Prince Lear. And it's kind of cute, but also like it's not going to last. So it's like a bittersweet moment for the viewer. And she only realizes what's going on and who she once was. Like she's not even a human. She's a unicorn trapped in a human body when King Hagrid tells her what he's done to the, all the unicorns and all the while Molly and Smendrick as this is going on and King's freaking out and Malthea is like I don't get it <laughs> and who knows where Prince Lear is at this point um they have figured out where the Red Bull's lair is to escape and to like get her back to being a unicorn and also releasing the unicorns because now it's out that King Lear has taken all these unicorns because of the Red Bull and they're in the sea and how are we going to fix it? Because this is messed up. And oh yeah, we need to turn Amalthea back into a unicorn because it's not working out. And how did they figure out this riddle? I think it's just so cute. There is a scraggly old tabby cat that decides to speak to Molly and then he only gives her so much information and he's like, I'm a cat, I did enough. And then he stops talking to her. <laughs> and so then uh, they're at this kind of tunnel that's protected by this skeleton that can talk. It's he's dead right he's a traitor was a traitor still is a traitor and he was just smacked right on to this little not altar but it's so there's a tunnel and there's like cute little iron workings whatever and he was just placed on those iron workings and he loves a good wine bottle and so just to help the situation move along. Smendrick turns water into wine. And <laughs> he gives the skeleton the wine, and I mean, it obviously it does not stay anywhere. It just kind of blah, 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 all over the place. But then he, the riddle is figured out, and then the three of them go towards the tunnel. But then the skeleton's like, "Yeah, I'm a traitor," and so 
and I can't change what I am. So he starts screaming for King Hagger to fix the problem, whatever. It's a great scene and I just, I love the skeleton. I don't know why. I have an affinity to inanimate objects talking, especially if they're like skulls or like trees. I don't know why. It's just really fun <laughs> for me. I, I don't know where that comes from, but it was always a thing since I was a kid. So that really amused me. This is where we are at the impasse of love and death and, and mortality and happiness and all that stuff because the unicorn battles the red bull and she does win she wins and releases those thousands of unicorns but prince lear is killed protecting her and when she finally all at the end uh, defeats the bull and the other unicorns are released and they're running running away and the castle with King Haggard in it is crumbling and he's freaking out. Good, bye bye, you're dead. She brings the prince back to life and thanks him. The big moments, really, when I tear, uh, tear up a little bit inside and is where she is running through the forest in the beginning of the movie after deciding to find all the lost unicorns because she doesn't want to be the last one. And also kind of, sort of, realizing she might very well be the last unicorn. And what would that life be like? Like, what does that really entail? Like, the last unicorn. That's deep. <laughs> well, yeah, I think there's, there are other fantasy uh, novels and film that kind of discuss that, like the last vampire or the last elf all immortal unless like they're really like specifically killed and what does that mean for them lonely usually it's about loneliness and the decision if you want to continue living on your own or maybe you befriend other creatures or like do you off yourself like <laughs> The second point where I tear up a little bit inside is when she's turned into a human and she says, I can feel this body dying around me, that exact line pulled from the movie, because as an immortal, like I said before, she doesn't have that concept of mortality until it's forced upon her to, yes, save her, but she never thought she would be turned into a human or if that was even possible, because Smendrick has said over and over again, I'm a shitty magician, but he like let go of his thoughts or whatever he wants to argue, and then he turns a unicorn into a human, which is a huge deal, right? But she just doesn't get that concept of mortality until she feels it. And then you are also feeling it, like I said. You unconsciously or consciously realize that, depending on your age, you're slowly decaying and you're going to die, ultimately, as everything does. But the unicorn or other immortals do not get it. We get it, and now Amalthea gets it. And it's just, mm, wow, that's a lot. It's a lot to take in. The last point where... I really tear up is at the end after the unicorns are freed and she says to the group and quote I am no longer like the others for no unicorn was born that could regret but I do I regret because she was a human for months and she remembers all of that and in saying that one line and then thanking the group for that, for that regret, for the sadness, for human feelings that she does, she never had a concept of. She is now different. She is not alone anymore because the thousands of unicorns are now released, but she is still different because, which is really heavy. What? Wait, hold on. She is saying, even though she has these negative feelings, and scary experiences 
they are still important and valuable and she ultimately saved thousands of unicorns but she therefore is different from all of them because they will never understand the sacrifices that she went through and that her three friends went through as well. Those three points are also, I would say, scary. I mean, I tear up not because I'm scared, because it's very moving. It's because a lot of that is very subtle, like I said, and can be easily read over in the book. But I think not really when you're watching it happen with beautiful animation. You're sitting down and you're watching this and you're like, oh my god, <laughs> this is intense. <laughs> because the framing of mortality and immortality is a bit different than other animated shows or films or even fantasy books. And I think that's why, you know, it's a classic. This book is a classic because the unicorn is immortal and she doesn't understand mortality and an afterlife other than the skeleton. We see there's an afterlife kind of sort of with the skeleton, but we don't hear about afterlives. We don't hear about heaven or hell. They talk a lot about their legacy and leaving behind a legacy, like basically all the characters do, but she doesn't really because she's immortal like what you know what but that changes when she becomes a human and mortal another point that could be like scary like uncomfortable is the loss of innocence with the unicorn and molly molly wishes she saw and interacted with the unicorn as a kid when she was innocent but as an adult who was living with bandits and basically the only woman in that band of thieves that were doing illegal activities. She's not innocent anymore. That hits differently as a kid versus as an adult and especially if you as a kid had to grow up fast or you wouldn't survive and that would be namely trauma. Now do we know when Molly joined the band of thieves? No. Do we know what happened to her where her innocence innocence was killed and she had to become an adult very fast no but it's basically hinted at in the book and in the movie but more so in the movie like something or things happened to her where she was just cut off from the innocence and she's angry about that but now she can kind of relive some sort of childhood childhood experience because now she has a unicorn and she's protecting the unicorn and she's motherly. I think she still could have been more fleshed out. She does not need to just cook and clean and tell Smendrick to get it together, like help the unicorn. But I can see in some ways her doing that is kind of reliving her childhood experience with the unicorn but also being an adult at the same time like very protective very motherly like i said and another point about the the concept of innocence is the unicorn becoming a human and mortal and feeling and experiencing human life which for her is traumatizing we get it I, yeah um life can be very traumatizing unicorns in the lore are for innocence and maidens specifically like virgins um so peter oak the unicorn's innocence and like that whole concept to save the other unicorns because she was ultimately turned into a human and she couldn't have done what she did with smendrick and prince lear and molly if she stayed a unicorn she would have been uh, thrown into the sea and there would be no unicorns and oh yeah no plot right <laughs> but she sees that you know at the end when she is now a unicorn she feels all the human feelings but now she's back where she wants and yeah no other unicorn will get it they will not ever understand so she is lonely but not lonely at the same time like i mentioned before now i love books and films that are dark 
but nowadays if children's books or films that aren't farting out rainbows and absolute happiness all the freaking time they're considered dark now <sighs> that's another <laughs> uh, conversation <laughs> but sometimes it's okay to have dark children or preteen or teen geared media books film and also have the farting pure happiness books media film because i always see the argument it's too much for kids it's going to traumatize them they're going to leave the theater sobbing and we're going to have to take your take the child to therapy because it's just too much it depends on the child for sure now i watched the movie when i was like four didn't have a problem that doesn't mean that another four-year-old is not going to freak out, okay? I think it is individual and it's about the maturity and the personality so far of the child and that is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But the argument that there should only be pure happiness media for children, tweens, and teenagers, I'm not buying it and I will never buy it. It's not a good argument. We need both. And I think that, though I don't really consider The Last Unicorn dark, fine, other people can classify it as dark. I think that it's very important for not, maybe not four-year-olds, but I'll, I mean, it depends, maybe, especially if you watch it as a family together. I think that would be um, the caveat, watched more darker movies, and read together in a group setting darker books like it's a you know support system and you can uh, ask questions and people whoever can answer them I think that is way more productive than saying don't ever make a last unicorn movie or a black cauldron movie or you know things like that and then you know if you want to have a like a just a fantastic pure happiness book or you know a tv show or movie yeah but i think both are important because you can't shy away from the fact that we are mortals and your child at one point or another they're gonna be asking about death because they're gonna see it even a dead fly they're gonna ask or like they accidentally uh, stepped on a, a slug it's dead now well, what what does that mean like it's going to come up and i think that media either if it's pure happiness all goody goody or more like the last unicorn or the dark crystal where that is talked about and shown both important but don't say that dark or heavy or deep media is not ever suitable for children. I don't buy that argument. I would say stop assuming that kids and tweens and teenagers are stupid. I saw that a lot and I still see that a lot. Are they naive? Do they have a lack of it? life experience? Yes. Also their brains aren't fully developed. They're still developing. Totally get it, but they're not stupid. They, they understand, right? And so they're human. They're little teacup humans, I like to say, but they're still human. They're growing with their experience and the personalities and they don't fully understand emotions, but they have emotions and okay, they understand emotions sometimes more than adults that like to hide things. Like, mm, so it's not always like a win-win when you're an adult versus a kid with emotions and personality and all that stuff. Usually kids are a little bit more honest but because they're more honest and they don't know a lot and just because they're like five years old they're gonna ask unnerving difficult philosophical questions which i did all the time and my grandmother had to basically take over because my mom was like oh my gosh not this again life is life i don't know what else to talk to you about <laughs> so she's like go ask your grandmother who was the spiritual science minister and 
also really big into science, so it wasn't just about uh, spirituality and religion. So it was a good mix, right? But not everyone has that life experience. And the, the kids and tweens and teenagers are going to ask unnerving questions and all that stuff. And it's okay if you feel uncomfortable with that. But I think that not only discussing it and answering the questions, but also showing it or like reading about it is really helpful because sure they might get questions answered you know from their support system but i know that they're also asking like okay but what do other people think what does this concept mean to other people like it's a real it's it's deep it's hard life's hard right so i'm just gonna wrap up and say that this was and still is a fantastic movie and I recommend it to any and all people, honestly. I really loved The Last Unicorn. Thank you so much for watching this very long video. I apologize, but also I don't. <laughs> so it's like a sorry, not sorry. Thank you for sticking around, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!